The following is a Shaw Public Affairs presentation. Blair Lextrom has one of the most interesting histories of anybody in the B.C. Liberal Caucus or even the legislature. After he quit the caucus and the cabinet, took a huge pay cut over the way the government implemented the HST, he actually sat as an independent member for a while and then came back not just to the caucus but to the cabinet. That makes for quite a career. Welcome back to Voice to Welcome, welcome back. Welcome to Voice of BC. I'm Vaughn Palmer and only slightly addled tonight. Uh, I was thinking about the fact that we got Blair Lextrom on the show and that we've had him on the show in all three capacities. We had him on the show as energy minister, then he quit. We had him on the show as an independent. And here he is back as a cabinet minister, not just a cabinet minister, but a cabinet minister in charge of selling the HST. You've had an interesting year. It has been a very interesting year, Vaughn, and uh, you know every day is a learning experience, but uh, I enjoy it. Huh? Okay, so <laughs> you did a telephone town hall tonight. People are watching us live on Thursday. Telephone town hall on the HST. So what's involved in this? Well, it's a dial-up. This is the fourth one I've uh, done. So the first one was the Peace River area. Uh, dial-up goes out to every household in the region. There was 22,000 in the northeast. Uh, 5,900 people participated in that call. On average, they were on the call for 21 minutes. Uh, tonight, 29,000 people were on the call. I was doing part of the Lower Mainland. Uh, what's involved is it's about listening, really. We, you put it out there of what we're doing, why we would like to hear, and then you open it up to hear from the callers. And you get as many questions as you can uh, through the system. Uh, they put their questions forward. They'll put their views forward. Probably the most, I was very impressed, i got to tell you, Vaughn. I, I didn't know what to think going into these telephone town halls. Uh, I'm sold on them now. I mean, when you can engage that many people that you represent in a province on major issues, uh, I think we'll get through this part of it on the HST and talk to them. But I would see governments, not just ours, but other governments in this country, utilizing this method to engage the people they represent in the future. Wow. Yeah, because that's a lot. It that's is. That's a lot. Uh, I mean, I, you know, we get a few dozen letters on an issue at the paper. It's a big deal. Uh, I get a lot of emails on issues. I get a lot of hits on my blog, but still, in the thousands, that's a lot. That's yeah. a lot of feedback. It is. And the one thing you hear, I mean, we heard everything and here's what I would do to improve it. Here's, you know, right. I like it, I don't like it. Probably overwhelmingly, though, whether people were supportive or not supportive, they said, you know what, thanks. Thanks for this opportunity. And uh, I couldn't disagree. I thought it worked well. Uh, you and the other two ministers have been doing this, Pat Bell and Kevin Falcon. Your next job is, do you put together like a report to cabinet saying these are the improvements people recommended? You know, everything we've heard uh, obviously is recorded, combined, put together. The real focus will be up to the Minister of Finance. I mean, that is his uh, jurisdiction. We went out to do what we could to help as far as engaging the public and listening, but uh, the next step will really be, uh, I would put the lead as uh, Kevin for sure. Okay. And my understanding from what the, the government has said, and Falcon said it again this week, uh, and the Premier said it today, fairly tight time frame. The ballots on the referendum start getting mailed out in mid-June, mm -hmm. and the government intends to announce what it is going to do if anything, mm -hmm. to lighten the burden of the HST if people vote to save it. So we'll probably get that some kind of an announcement in the next few weeks. I would think so. I mean, you have to get it out there while people have their ballots so that it is uh, they can digest if they're thinking, you know, it would be better, I would support it if they did this, and, and you know, vice versa too. The people, I think, a lot of them have made up their mind already. Others are certainly engaged in this uh, discussion we're having, the information that's going out there from both sides. So mm -hmm. I think there's... Human nature, uh, what I've experienced in government is when government says something, there's a little bit of skepticism to say, hold General it, is that Biden. right? I know, hard to believe, <laughs> but uh, I think it's a great campaign, both sides, you know, saying, yeah, here's why I would like it and vote for it, here's why I wouldn't, and uh, I'm looking forward to the results. Whatever so we got a, uh, they took the wraps today off of uh, the information ads that are going out, yeah. the government's putting out. This is the ones featuring Stickman, <laughs> who's this little fellow that goes on the screen, and you'll see him, and he's looking at a whole bunch of save the HST signs, and he's looking at a bunch of bring back the PST signs, and then the message is decide for yourself, and it shows the uh, link to the website right. where the government has a whole bunch of information. So 
That's a pretty expensive series of ads. Five million bucks? Boy, Surprise yeah. Surprise you it's that much? You know what, it does. I mean, uh, advertising is expensive, I guess, primarily on the major markets. I have to believe that's uh, without question where the vast majority of this is. It isn't in the production of these, I wouldn't think. Uh, they're pretty straightforward. Uh, ads. Newspapers are pretty expensive. I was, advertising. Uh, <laughs> I'm shocked that you're buying ads in newspapers. Oh, right? there you go. <laughs> Uh, do you think, I, I mean, I, I guess we'll hear from people whether or not they think that's a good expenditure. Mm -hmm. You know, I think it is. I mean, the key issue, these ads are not saying support the HST or not. They're saying, look, and I believe this, everybody has an opinion on the HST. If we can do our job, everybody will have an informed opinion. And this is both the pro and the con side. If they base their vote on an informed opinion, I don't think you can ask more of the people you represent than that. Other news this week, before we get to some questions on tape for Blair Lexter. Um, last night, pretty exciting 90 minutes on the old computer watching the numbers come in in Vancouver Point Grey for much of the evening as the numbers came in poll by poll. The Premier was trailing in that riding. David Eby, the New Democrat, who was not given much of a chance, for a while there, it looked like we might be headed for an upside. Right at the end, the final uh, polling stations came in, and the Premier ended up with uh, about a 500-vote win, uh, about three percentage points in the popular vote. So, close. Very close. I think most people, you know, that were closely uh, related to this, probably on both sides, uh, New Democrats or the, the BC Liberals, felt it was going to be close right from the beginning. I, uh, I certainly was under no illusion. Was it closer than I thought it would be? Yeah, it was. Um, but any time, <coughs> you know, you talk about a win. Uh, I've been in a number of elections now going back to 1993 when I started with council. Uh, toughest application process for a job in the world, I think. You're out there selling yourself. So I think uh, our Premier, Christy, I think she did a good job. I think without question there's still concern out there, and I think that was reflected not just uh, with Christy, I think it really with the government. People are still saying, okay, we've done some significant things already under Christy's leadership, made some changes, some positive moves. I think they're still wondering, you know, is this for real? Is it going to carry on? And uh, I'm pretty confident it is. And now definitely having Christy in the house, uh, we'll be able to show that for sure. Do you think there are any lessons to be learned just from the by-election in terms of what else the party needs to do before there's a general election? You know, I guess if there's anything is make sure that you're out there communicating with the people you represent. Don't ever lose sight or take anything for granted. And uh, I think we've seen governments uh, over history start to become pretty complacent. Um, under, you know, I don't take anything away from our former Premier. We had a policy difference, uh, and I stand by that without question. But you want to make sure you don't get captured within the system which we work. Government is that way. and. I've been here 10 years now, and there's not a, a day goes by that, first of all, I'm not thankful to hold the position I've got. I walk into that building that's, you know, the most amazing building in the province of BC, being the legislature, but you can't be complacent, and you cannot take things for granted, whether things are going great or things are not going so good. You better hope that you can do something better today than you did yesterday, and if you reach the point where you think you can't do that, maybe it's time to move on. Liberal Party convention in Penticton this weekend, and I see uh, my colleague Justin Hunter, Justine Hunter, wrote it in the paper today that uh, uh, Gordon Campbell has decided to pass on the tribute to Gordon Campbell. He's not even going to be there. Yeah, you know, I guess I'm not sure if Gord's in the country or if he's still traveling or whatever. Uh, if he's traveling, I, I hope he's enjoying himself. I, I know he got some good golf games in, from what I understand. You know, I think it was a challenging time, and, you know, I made the decision I did based, as I said, on policy. I think there was, uh, you know, I can't speak for Gord, but uh, for a guy that put his entire life really into helping build a better city in Vancouver and a better province in British Columbia, I think there's probably still some sting left there. Maybe next year's convention. Yeah. Uh, we've got a lot of questions for Blair Lextrom on tape. We should get going on them. Uh, we'll go back to the HST first of all. Uh, uh, Paul Ramsey, here he is. Mr. Lextrom, when you resigned from the Liberal Cabinet and caucus to sit as an independent, it was because you recognized that your constituents were absolutely unalterably opposed to the HST. Now you're back in, and you're going to try to convince them the HST is a good thing. Are they really going to be happy with this? <laughs> well, that's a great question, Paul. You know, I left, I've, I was never opposed to the tax. I mean, I go back to 2002 when I chaired the Finance Committee. What I was opposed to was when it became very clear very quickly after our decision that the public said, put the brakes on, 
come and engage us. And at that point, we were unwilling to do that. That's why I left. Now I'm back and the people that I represent, they know where I've stood on the tax all along. So um, they have no problem with that, the people I'm talking to. Uh, many of the people I represent do support it. Many of the votes in my region, I think not unlike the rest of the province, were as much about how the government rolled this out as it was about the tax itself. So um, where I stand, I support the tax. I think it's sound tax policy. But if at the end of the day, British Columbians have a different view, that's what government's about. We aren't here for government. We're here for the people that we represent. So, uh, again, we have a great province. We're going to make work whichever way this vote goes. Um, I, I, the one thing I wonder about, and I mean, I, for one thing, I wonder if the anger over how it was done, which was entirely justified, has faded mm -hmm. enough to save the tax. Because, you know, that's, that's the first question. And I guess the other question I have is people, the, if, the, if people vote to go back to the, the PST and the GST, to me one of the things that really came out of that report from the independent panel was um, it's going to take about two years to unwind mm -hmm. this thing and it is going to blow one giant hole in the provincial budget, about two to three billion dollars, right? Yeah. And so I mean, people can get rid of the tax, but they can't get rid of the consequences of getting rid of the tax is I guess what I thought. I don't know if you get that message across, but uh, we're in for a fairly long struggle still if we vote to get rid of this thing. I agree. And it has the anger, I think the anger has subsided some, um, probably for the main reason, government saying, you know what, we made a mistake. And it's rare, Vaughn. I mean, I've, you've studied government probably longer than I have. And uh, it's pretty rare you see a government say we made a mistake. And even rarer to say we're going to try and fix it. And uh, that's what's taking place here as far as the rollout of it. The anger, I think, has subsided some. Uh, but the cost of a no vote, or a vote to go back to the PST, GST, is expensive. Uh, I engage a, a lot of my friends who in this discussion all the time, and uh, many of them recognize the benefits. There's still some say, you know, I'm, I'm not there yet. You know, if we vote against it, the government's going to have to pay, and we're the government, all of us. All of British Columbia will pay for this. So, and when you say that, sometimes you get the opposite, that's a threat. It's not a threat. It's a reality that regardless whether it's the BC Liberals in power or whoever would be in power in this, if the vote is to go back to the GST, PST style, there is about a $3 billion hit. That means that's $3 billion less to provide services and so on. So some difficult choices before us. And remember, if you vote no on this thing, you're actually voting to yes. save the HST, yes. not to get rid of it. The question was worded by Bill Van Der Zem and Cristalini, not by the government. But Correct. a friend of mine joked, he said, send a message to the Liberals, vote no on the HST. <laughs> yeah. That means you'd save it, actually. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, David Shrek has a question for you. Here he is. Blair, in your telephone town hall meetings on the HST, you're providing some information by way of HST credits. Can you tell us of the 1.1 million British Columbians eligible for the credit, how many get less than $100 a year? Some get more, I know that. Well, some get more. Uh, it ranges based on the amount of income you bring in. So an individual, a uh, low-income individual earning $20,000, for example, I use ballpark numbers here. Um, would get in the range of it the $230 back. Uh, and then it escalates based on whether you're a family of two, four, so on. I don't have a number of how many people would receive uh, $100 or less. The reality is 1.1 low-income British Columbians are impacted in a positive manner on this. To the degree of that positive result is based on their income and the family size. Yeah, because they get they get them for the for your children too if they're, yes, you if, they, if you qualify, right? Yeah. So and folks, if you're not getting this thing, you should be, and uh, that's something to contact your government office on too. Because I know I, I've heard a couple of times people say, well, "What? A, where did this thing come from?" And I went. You might be getting it, and it may come in a check from the federal government, and you have to read the fine print to see that it's actually a, an HST credit. But anyway, that is happening. It. You bring up a good yeah, point. Yeah. I think the government should come around your house and hand it to a person <laughs> and say, "Here you go. Sign for this, please." Well, there's an People idea. People know they're getting. Ah, <laughs> uh, we got a question for you. We're going to move on. You are transportation minister. Mm -hmm. You like it being transportation minister? Is I love it, a it. Fun ministry? You know what? It's fun. It's got lots of new challenges. I love reading. I, mean, I go through a lot of legislation, go through a lot of uh, everything that we've done in our history. You know, Kevin Falcon obviously yeah. served for a good number of years, uh, Shirley Bond uh, just before me. Uh, transportation is probably one of the uh, primary issues I've dealt with for 10 years in my riding. We have uh, a great need for improvements, but 
the ability to learn what the needs of every different region are, uh, particularly when you look at the island and the lower mainland, I mean, those needs are different than what we see in rural British Columbia. No, they're all the same. They want the road paved. They, well, <laughs> paved, heck, sometimes people want just some good gravel up there. Yeah. <laughs> how, many, how many miles of unpaved road or kilometers of unpaved road are there in your riding now, and how many will there be <laughs> in three years? Well, uh, we have about 2,900 kilometers of road in the riding I represent. We have a good chunk of them paved. We got, uh, the majority would be gravel right now, okay. and uh, I don't think I could... Uh, you know, tell you I can pave them all, but we're going to try and ensure that every road is a decent road so families can get to and from what they have to do, not just work, but, you know, their children going to and from, whether it be uh, dance class or their hockey or baseball. We got challenges. I mean, many of our roads were built 50, 60, 70 years ago. The base is the issue. I mean, in my area, you know, the old did the old corduroy, folded the wood into the, the base, covered it up with some rock and... Uh, you know, gravel and away it goes, and they start to deteriorate pretty quick, especially with the heavy equipment we see on them today. So it's not cheap to fix roads. I found that out in a hurry. I, I had a friend who, or not a friend, it was a, a minister who was on this show once who said that, you know, in, in a lot of parts of British Columbia, the, 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 the road system is part of the social network because it's how you get to the hospital, it's how you get to school, it's how you get to everything you got to travel to and if if you're looking at a three-hour drive to the hospital the state of the road is actually part of the health care system too. It's, it's an interesting way to look at it. I mean you know we don't think of that so much in the city but you can I can see the point that's, if there's only one road in town. That you know what? That's a, a great deal. point and you know whether you're in the city or not I transportation is the backbone to our economy and mm -hmm. it's the backbone to any economy yeah. in this country. If, you need to be able to move your goods and service and people in order to have a strong economy and, and get your products to market. And uh, we're going to continue to do that. Uh, I have a question for you from the Highways Critic, Harry Baines. Here he is. Minister after minister before you committed TransLink to billions of dollars unfunded projects. In 2010, the government and the Mayor's Council signed a memorandum of our agreement committing to a long-term funding strategy to pay for all those projects and yet nothing has been done. Can you tell us whether you will be a different and you will actually take action and give TransLink long-term sustainable funding as you have promised so that we can pay for the Evergreen Line and pay for some of the Fraser projects and pay for the Broadway Corridor Line? All right, that's a great question, Harry, and uh, I look forward to answering. I've already met with the Mayor's Council. I think that uh, they've got, obviously, a great deal of work ahead of them. A couple of points to that question. The Evergreen Line, we are at the table. We've put $410 million forward. Uh, the federal government has $417 million. Uh, the Mayor's Council is presently going through, a, I guess, a process right now to find out how they're going to fund their $400 million commitment. Uh, I think we can get there. There's always seems to have been this struggle between, you know, TransLink and, and government at times. Uh, I'm an optimist, so we're going to get there. So there's two things. There's the short-term issue we have to resolve on the Evergreen funding. Let's, let's find out how you're going to raise the money. We want to work with you. The MOU that was signed wasn't to fund the Evergreen per se. It was to find, as Harry said, the long-range uh, solution to this. Is it a mix of, you know, different types of funding that can come in? And I think it is going to be a mix. It's not going to be one silver bullet that fix that, fixes that, but uh, it's expensive. And I understand the concerns of the Mayor's Council, but uh, the reality is, at the end of the day, it isn't about saying, yeah, we want to do it, just have another level of government pay for it. The partnership we've got on the Evergreen is a tremendous one. Uh, having met with the Mayor's Council, I think they've got some innovative ideas. The MOU really lays out, says, look, we want to work with you. Let's look at every option we have out there and find a solution. And if, if I had to say I'm different, I don't know if I'm different. The commitment I gave to the Mayor's Council is I'm going to work with you and we're going to find this solution. Uh, I think my predecessors worked as hard as they could and timing is everything. Right now we're ready to, to go on well, the Well, someone's going to end up paying for it. And I know the mayors don't want to load it on the property tax because they think too much is already put on the property tax. So that leaves what? Gas tax? Parking tax? Well, there's those. I mean, they've floated other ideas. I know I've just recently heard, uh, you know, they're talking about a regional carbon tax <coughs> in the sense. I know okay. the New Democrats have said, you know, carbon tax and transportation. I think Harry would probably support that. I don't want to put words in his mouth. But what we said is, let's look at everything here. Let's not take anything off the table. Let's find a kind of a pool of ideas that we can draw from and get on with this. The public, to be honest, I think are saying, you know what? We elect you people, whether it's at local government or provincial or federal, 
We ask you to find the solutions. Get on with it. We want the Evergreen Line. We want our transit systems and transportation networks to work. And uh, I'm committed to making sure. You got sure. a target date for getting going on the Evergreen Line? You know, we've, I'm going back to meet with the Mayor's Council here relatively soon. I couldn't meet with them at their last meeting. We're in session. Uh, I would like to think fairly soon. Uh, we originally have, supposed to start this year. Well, it, it was originally supposed to be yeah. built by, I don't yeah. know. 1952 or something, <laughs> if you look back to the old commitments. But, but. soon. I, this is not something we want to drag on for months and months or years and years. I mean, we have a, we've already put the RFQs who are out there. Uh, we've had respondents to that. So you have to move fairly quickly to get the uh, request going to build this thing. We will take a brief break on Voice of BC with the Transportation Minister, Blair Lextrom. Stay with us. As Minister of Transportation, Blair Lextrom has to cut a lot of ribbons on projects he's had absolutely nothing to do with. It takes five to ten years to begin to plan a major transportation project. The minister in the job for a couple of months is pretty new. Your source for in-depth, local political coverage. This is Shaw TV, your local voice. Crime happens, but where it happens and who becomes the victim can be influenced by you and your community. As the eyes and ears of their neighborhoods, Block Watch programs assist police by reporting suspicious activity. I'm witnessing a theft from a vehicle. To learn more about crime prevention in your neighborhood, contact your local police department or the Block Watch Society of BC. If you would like to contact us at Voice of BC, write to us. Our mailing address is 111 1925 Blanchard Street, Victoria, BC, V8T4J2, or send us an email to vobc at shaw.ca. What's your thing? Bugs. My thing's sound effects. Here's a T-Rex. <laughs> Nobody's good at everything. Everybody's good at something. What's your thing? Really what's happened is the Ferry Corporation hasn't done what the government originally set out to do. What the government originally set out to do was introduce competition into the ferry system and the two or three silly little routes they put out nobody wanted to buy and they backed away from it with this long-term labour agreement that Vince Reddy negotiated. What really needs, that public monopoly needs, is some competition on those major routes. And then we might see them sharpen their pencils, because they're not very sharp right now. Welcome back to Voice of BC. Highways Minister, he used to be Highways Minister, it's now Transportation and Infrastructure. Um, Minister Blair Lextrom, and a lot of questions for him, so let's go right straight back into them. Here's Bill Tillman. Minister, you'll soon be announcing Bike to Work Week, which is a great initiative, and it's not about motorcycles, by the way, but bicycles. And at the same time, we have protesters camped out to stop highway expansion. Can you explain that contradiction? So the protesters have actually left. They were yes. blocking the South Fraser Perimeter Road, which I suspect many people don't even know exists, although it's well underway, right? It is. It's um, you know probably 45, close to 50 percent complete. So. You know, Bill asked an interesting question, how do you match those two? I think it is going to take a match of both. I mean, the cycling uh, paths that we've put in and the programs that we've worked with our local communities on around the province, I think, are working very well. There are areas where I think they're going to work better than others, and obviously climate will be a part of that if we're looking at year-round cycling. But as much as we can do, I mean, when we look at transportation, whether it's cycling, whether it's transit options, People have a love affair with their vehicles, and uh, that's not government telling them to have a love affair with them. They do, and the reality is, I think we need that mix. We got to find the proper balance. So, um, bike to work week. I mean, it's amazing the amount of people that actually jump on a pedal bike. I always thought they should have a motor, but uh, many people ride with the pedals. Uh, it's staggering the number, even in the north where I live, and many people seem to equate, you know, biking to work with, you know, some of the lower mainland or the interior. Uh, it is becoming more and more prevalent in our society right around the province. So. The minister, folks, has this giant, motor, terrifying motorcycle <laughs> that I wouldn't go near. 
Uh, and he actually bikes to work on it, <laughs> all the way from Fort St. John sometimes, right? All right. Roads are good. Are roads good to motorcycles? Good, you know good for cruising? They're pretty well. It's a great way to actually find the problems on them. Um, you know, I say that and some people smile, but in all honesty, you know, I can jump on a, my bike at home and in Dawson Creek and I can go for a ride and do the loop out to Tumbler Ridge or Chetland, Hudson's Hope or Fort St. John and uh, you can come back with some ideas. I mean, it's easier to find the problems out there without question. And we had, a, we had a highways minister who used to test the roads in a Cadillac. That was Phil Gillardi. Ah, and when he go. was speeding, he said he was testing the curve. So uh, <laughs> if, you, if you see the minister out there on his motorbike. So anyway, the South Fraser Perimeter Road encampment is gone. But the, the, the bike thing, uh, some fabulous bike trails in the provincial capital recently. Right? The Galloping Gooses. Just people come yes. from all over the place for that one. Uh, we had a real mess on the highway here, uh, near the provincial capital recently, and it raised the question of what we're allowing on our roads. Here with a question about it is Ben Parfit. The recent spill of oil and gas uh, along the uh, Malahat uh, and into Goldstream Provincial Park really highlights, I think, the uh, uh, significant threats uh, posed to the environment by the transportation of hazardous goods. I'm wondering uh, what you would have to say, however, about the fact that literally hundreds of hazardous goods shipments in the province every year are occurring uh, without uh, people that handle those goods actually reporting what they're moving. What needs to be done to better track hazardous waste shipments in the province? Well, I mean, obviously a very unfortunate incident. Uh, and I think the individual obviously is, you know, looking at taking uh, a big hit on this one because he wasn't being a responsible driver. Uh, anytime you have that accident, you know, we do the best we can to clean it up. I mean, but how do we do it? We actually have programs in place and we have regulation when you're moving hazardous material, whether it be on uh, our roads, uh, for instance. When you look, many people will have noticed this, particularly if they're involved in the trucking industry, they'll know what I'm talking about. Our placards, depending on what you're moving, how they're placarded. Um, so we have that already. I'm not sure if uh, Ben was aware of that but we do a pretty good job. It doesn't mean we can, I say we, society, because this isn't, you can't point the finger at government and say, gee, government, you caused that truck to hit the wall and, and spill this off. It was an unfortunate accident. It was an um, unfortunate location. Unfortunate location for sure. We have to ensure, it goes to the driver as well. I mean, drivers have to be responsible. The vast majority are. Uh, but when we get an irresponsible person out there, and, and certainly in this case, uh, carrying some hazardous materials, if it turns out that um, you know the individual is guilty of an offense, um, I don't know what the solution is to that. It is a, a difficult one. But overall, I can tell you, we have some of the safest highways in the province, or in the country, and our transportation, and many of it is governed by, uh, whether we're talking national standards as well, uh, much of our trucking industry transcends just British Columbia, of course. They go across and work under the National Safety Code as well. So we got a pretty good system. If there's ways to improve it, uh, I always encourage people. I can tell you as the Minister of Transportation, it doesn't mean I have every answer for transportation issues. So if there's things I can look at, get them to me. Oh, here's Paul Ramsey with a question that will make you squirm and your constituents <laughs> squirm even more. He's used to represent a riding in the north. Oh, well, I guess Prince George is the south, if you're from Dawson Creek. Central Creek. BC, anyway, Prince George. Is. Paul Ramsey, here we go. Mr. Lexton, I went on your website this morning just to see how you were doing in transportation, and there you were posed by the $3 billion Port Man Bridge. You come from the north, like I do, and I tell you, my impression is the north is angry at not getting its fair share of infrastructure projects. They look down at the Portman Bridge and the Golden Ears Bridge and the Perimeter Road and the Sea to Sky Highway, and they say, what are we in the north, chopped liver? When's the north going to get its fair share of infrastructure projects? All right. Well, great question, Paul. And uh, we're certainly getting more money today than we did in the 90s, Paul. Well, I'm just giving you a bad time. Um, we actually have invested pretty heavily in our rural road infrastructure in this province. So the issue is making sure we understand what everybody's needs are. Um, you know, I can tell you in the North Peace and South Peace in the, the northeast part of our province, we've invested about close to a billion dollars in the last 10 years. Uh, you know, more than... It's more than has ever been spent at any point in our history in the province of British Columbia in that region. If you look to the Kootenays or the Prince George area or the Northwest or the interior, 
Uh, everybody's getting, I think, a pretty good kick at the can. Now, there is some major projects down here, whether it be the South Fraser Perimeter, or the Port Man, or the Highway 1. Um, you know, the one thing years ago, I can tell you, I probably didn't think this way, but you come to a conclusion pretty quickly, you recognize that we all need each other, and that includes the transportation infrastructure. Our grain producers need the ports of Vancouver. Uh, Vancouver needs rural British Columbia in the resource sector. So the one thing I talk about a lot is saying, look, we got to find some common ground here so we can understand that when money is spent in one area, is it just to benefit that or can we all benefit? Um, out on the Portman Bridge, it was an amazing tour that I went on. The congestion down here is staggering, you know, in some of the areas. Even the, uh, I was out, they call it the Callwood Crawl. I was heading out uh, to some meetings out that way. It is a challenge, you, you understand. And many times when people in rural BC hear about that, they go, ah, what are the, what's going on there? Uh, there's a reality that uh, there's need here, there's need in rural BC, and we're going to make sure we meet all those needs. The traffic load on the Port Man is amazing too. Is it 150,000 crossings a day, something yes. like that? Yeah. yeah. Oh, well, we got a question about the Port Man. Because <laughs> uh, the one thing you can say about 150,000 crossings a day is that if you were able to collect three bucks off every one of them, <laughs> you're going to have a pretty good cash flow. Here's a question with that. Here's Harry Baines. Minister, when Portman project was announced, it was announced that the, the maximum tolling would be $3. But when the tolling agreement was made public last year, it was revealed that unless you have a transponder or you, or you pay within 48 hours, the uh, tolls will go up to over $5. Can you tell us, is that fair? Well, actually, I would say it's probably not fair, but it's not correct either. So what it is, is there's discussions uh, going to be ongoing here very soon. And the toll is $3 uh, when it opens. Uh, there will be a time frame for you to pay that. And if you don't pay it, and I don't know what that time frame will be. It won't be 48 hours, that I can tell you. I don't think that's a reasonable time frame. Somebody's uh, out for a weekend or a week and they get home and find out that they didn't have a transponder. I don't imagine too many people in Dawson Creek will when they cross that bridge. Um, if there's a cost associated with sending out the bill or trying to collect, you're going to have to change it from $3 and it may be, look, we're collecting $4.50 or whatever the number's going to be so, you know, you can recover your cost. I'm not a believer in uh, sending something out and spending $20 to collect $5. I think that's ridiculous. And all of that's going to be looked at and put together. There will be consultation with the public on this to make sure everybody understands what, first of all, the options are as far as paying. And if you don't pay, what the time frame would be uh, once you've crossed that bridge to get the money in. So uh, I think Harry will probably be hopefully satisfied with that question. But yeah, if it was just as simple as uh, you don't pay, we're going to collect $5.20 off you within 48 hours, uh, I don't think that's true. If you go back and forth every day, you're going to have one of these little electronic detectors in yes. your car and get a monthly bill, mm -hmm. uh, which you pay online or something. That's what a transponder is. It's a yes. detector. Because there's no toll booths in this system. No, right? there isn't. I mean, the toll booths actually create uh, as much right. idling and... and if you, if you, when the, when the tolling was originally discussed on that project, there was a lot of talk about a sliding scale that, uh, I mean, we expect trucks will pay more, but there was also talk that in the off hours the, the rate might be discounted. Do, have they thought about that anymore, or is that not in the cards? No, nope, there's a great deal of thought going into that, and that's going to be part of the public engagement that uh, is forthcoming here. So I think there's a number of things off times. Uh, obviously, I think when you look at uh, there will be some exemptions, emergency vehicles, uh, PWD, people with disabilities. There's a handful of exemptions okay. that won't pay it. I think they've done a lot of good work, and I know they're looking forward to go out and engaging the public in this. Are you concerned, given what's happened with the Golden Ears Bridge, where there's been the, they haven't met any of the targets for traffic because people are avoiding it because of the tolls, that the same thing will happen with the Port Man? You know what? Probably not as worried in the sense, uh, obviously, the numbers are down over there. Uh, the Port Man is a significant through fare as well, and um, if it can cut the times like it's going to, if it's going to, the whole idea is to spend less time on the road. I mean, for a number of reasons, uh, not just the environment, but if you can get home and spend time with your family, that kind of is what it's about. So I don't share that concern. I'm hopeful that, uh, I mean, it's infrastructure. I think people realize that, you know, we're talking billions of dollars on the Highway 1 and Portman project, uh, over 2 billion, 2.43, I think, in that range. You gotta try and find a way to recover some of those costs. So 
Uh, we'll watch what happens. I think they've got a pretty good system, or hopefully they're planning that by the, what I understand. And uh, the transponders, I think, will be interchangeable between the golden ears and the other, so you won't mm -hmm. have to have two. Things like that I know they're looking at, and uh, the meetings I've had so far, I'm pretty mm -hmm. impressed. Uh, well, it wouldn't be this show if we didn't have a question on fairies. <laughs> Here he is from the TIE, Andrew McLeod. Minister Lextrum, you have said that you would consider increasing the subsidy to BC Ferries to keep the cost increases uh, under control. I'm wondering how your constituents in Peace River feel about that. <laughs> well, uh, I haven't had many calls uh, from them, but the ferry system, we have a pretty good ferry system. I mean, there's a lot of controversy around it all the time, whether it be Mr. Hahn and his salary, but uh, I do think we put forward a plan for BC Ferries, we put forward uh, our legislation, I think Mr. Hahn is operating to that. So I, I don't uh, think he has done a poor job. People, what they're saying to me is, Blair, it's not affordable, it's not sustainable in the long run. I mean, our service is up, our uh, customer satisfaction is up, I think we run one of the finest ferry systems in the world. But, you know, at the end of the day, if you, nobody can afford it, then it doesn't mean a lot. So what we're going to do, and I'm committed to this, is find a way to make sure that happens. I know we're going through right now the independent ferry commissioners looking yeah. at uh, what is available. The ferries has put forward, obviously, their requests at 4.15 and 8.23 percent, respectively, depending on the routes we're talking about. Boy, over 8% uh, per year for four years is a difficult, difficult situation. I don't think, in my mind, that's sustainable or acceptable. So I'm looking forward to what the commissioner can do. Uh, I'm also looking at uh, things that we can do. Although it's independent, the reality is when BC Ferries has an impact on people's lives, um, they come to the government. That's who they look to. Regardless whether we say we've moved it over here, we've tried to move uh, in a new direction, at the end of the day, we have to answer for that. And as I said, I mean, many people have spoken about David Hahn. Uh, I've met with him numerous times already in my capacity. I think he's done a good job. I think he's a good businessman. I think he has lived to the legislation that's there and done the best he can with what's available to him. Um, if we want to change direction on that, that's a government decision. Mm -hmm. And I think we have to, uh, you know, be prepared if we want to enter into that discussion. Uh, but right now I'm looking forward, Gord McAtee, who's our new uh, ferry commissioner, independent ferry commissioner, uh, receiving information and feedback from the public. And, and I'm looking forward to where we can go with this. Yeah, you make an interesting point about the independence because we had another one of those episodes this week with ICBC and mm -hmm. uh, Shirley Bond, the Solicitor General, former Transportation Minister, gets confronted with a headline in my newspaper, the Vancouver Sun, saying that ICBC is looking at changing the definition of safe drivers so that a third of the drivers on the road, with because those are the people with one, even one ticket, will be classified as dangerous and pay a premium. They didn't say how much the premium would be, but it would be a lot. And again, I, I heard her in a scrum today in the Capitol saying, look, they went ahead and they planned this. I'm the minister. I'm going to have to answer for it. I wish they'd told me, right? Yes. We saw it with Hydro. Hydro announces they're going to need, I don't know, 50% rate increase over mm -hmm. five years. I mean, they work these things out with a pocket calculator, right? They're not looking at the political fallout. Mm -hmm. You're no longer energy minister, but the new energy minister... Coleman has gone back to them and said, wait a minute, you know, we got to do the math on this, but we also have to do the political calculus and people don't want to pay more for everything without understanding why. Well, it's an interesting kind of situation we find ourselves in. You know, people don't, I don't think, want hydro rates being set at the cabinet table or ICBC rates, yet at the end of the day, you've, you've hit the nail on the head. If decisions are made by these crown corporations that affect you and I and our families and our daily lives, people traditionally aren't picking up the phone and calling ICBC and saying, you guys, what are you doing? They're calling the minister. Yes. They're calling the, their MLA. We've got to find, I think, a way to find, a, I guess, a little more cooperative way to do this. And uh, again, I never point the finger at anybody saying, you did a bad job or this. I mean, I agree with Shirley. I mean. Boy, if we're thinking every person in the province that has one speeding ticket is a poor driver, I don't agree with that. Um, we already have safe driver discounts. You'll get up to 42 or 43 yeah. percent if you go accident free and so on. And you pay now if you're a bad driver, you have points on your license, you get speeding tickets, you pay now. So we want to be cautious that this isn't about money. You know, if we're, it's, it's got to be about service. How do we provide the best level of service we can for the people that use this service? 
and do it in a way that, you know what, 10, 20, 30, 40 years from now, it's still there for the people of our province. We will take a brief break on Voice of BC with our Minister of Transportation, Blair Lextrom. Stay with us. My biggest disappointment on the BC Liberals' transportation policy is their commitment to expansion of freeways, uh, their commitment to roadways of all sorts, uh, because we know that in a climate-constrained world, we need to be investing in rail, and they haven't done that. Producing over 9,000 hours of local programming every year, this is Shaw TV, your local voice. As I'm driving to work, I can feel the anxiety building. My stomach starts to get sick. I start to sweat. It's a feeling of terror, like a life and death situation, basically. I always feel like I'm, you know, under a spotlight. I would kill myself at a certain point if things didn't get better. Anxiety and depressive disorders are the most common of all mental illnesses. For a free mental health screening, call our toll-free number or visit our website today. Miss something on Voice of BC? Catch an encore presentation of this show on your local Shaw TV. If you live in the Lower Mainland, Voice of BC rebroadcasts Saturday morning at 10.30 and Sunday afternoon at 4. On Vancouver Island, watch Voice of BC Saturday at 10 a.m. or Sunday afternoon at 2. To find out when Voice of BC rebroadcasts in all other parts of the province, please contact your local Shaw TV or check the TV listings for your area. Kidney disease affects an estimated 2 million Canadians. Many don't even know they have it. But thanks to the Kidney Foundation of Canada's innovative programs and vital research, countless people have been able to turn to us to help them manage, delay, and in some cases even prevent the disease. We're the Kidney Foundation of Canada. Please support us. We're behind you all the way. The carbon tax, if it's going to work, is going to have to be in place for a long time and clearly there's uh, a, a lot of resistance to that tax in certain quarters. Um, and I, I just have to wonder what fiscal policies we're going to put in place in this province that are, are going to get the job done. Welcome back to Voice of BC. Next week, uh, Adrian Dix is going to be on the show, our leader of the opposition. Uh, you got anything you want to ask him? You know, I guess if I could corner Adrian and ask him a question, I mean, it's, uh, I think there's always uh, room for opposition. I, I think opposing every single thing isn't always productive, but a lot of times in governments, and this transcends, I mean, history when you look at it, there's a lot of things the New Democrats right now are saying, spend more on, spend more on, spend more on. Virtually every question period, there's a, a kind of, I think that's the, the tendency. How are you going to pay for it? Right now, I mean, we're challenged. We're in a deficit situation in British Columbia. People are telling us, I want more services, I want to pay less. The New Democrats are coming out saying, we'll do that. And, uh, you know, Adrian, I think he works hard. I've known Adrian a long time. He's uh, very dedicated to what he does. Uh, I think the challenge that he faces right now is there's been a lot of things said about what they would do. I'm just not sure, uh, well, I'm pretty sure there's, there's no money available to do what they want to do. The question I'd say is, where's it coming from? Well, we'll play him that one. He's on the show next week. Uh, good of him to come on. Uh, I agree with you on work. If there's anybody around here that works harder than Adrian Dix, I don't know who it is because <laughs> uh, he's amazing on that regard. Uh, we got one more question for you on, uh, well, here he is, Bill Tillman. We'll let him ask it. Premier Gordon Campbell and then Transportation Minister Kevin Falcon promised and announced in 2008 that the number of buses in British Columbia in the transit system would be doubled by 2020. Can you tell us what progress has been made and whether that target still exists? Well, I think a great deal of progress has been made. I don't have a percentage to say we're this close to that number. Um, you know, one of the things I'm hearing a lot about is from communities right now saying, you know what, we're part of this transit system, we're part of it. We would really like to have a little more say in it. Let's come together. I've uh, had a couple of meetings already with different uh, community groups. I know there's some others being set up. Uh, I don't disagree. The The issue of saying, look, all, we have to learn to work together on this. And um, 
everybody. The more people you can bring to the table, the more ideas you get out there, the better opportunity there is to, uh, I think, move things forward. But the amount of buses, uh, we do pretty well. We have a great transit. BC Transit does a very good job for us. And uh, like anything else, can we improve it? Certainly we can. A lot of talk here in the capital region recently about light rail. There's a report came out saying that uh, something they think we should be looking at. I've often wondered whether there's the number of riders in the region to justify light rail, which, as we've seen in the lower mainland, is not cheap. Mm -hmm. You know, I know they've been, they went out, they're engaging the public, they're talking about the light rail is their recommendation. Very expensive. I mean, 950 million, I think, is the number. Uh, it's not a number that would be achievable by the communities here alone. I mean, I think it's fair to say that the provincial government uh, will be at the table, the federal government, I think, will be at the table. There would have to be, at the end of the day, uh, some cooperation there in order to make this economical for the people that are, are in this region. Um, if that's the, where they end up, I mean, it, you want to grow the ridership. I mean, at the end of the day, the Canada line, we were talking about that, I think, uh, it's far outperformed what anybody thought it would. I think the ability was 100,000 riders a day, a day, but it's also in a metropolitan region of yes. a couple of million people. Very much. So, I mean, there's a clear need to improve transit here, without question. I mean, we have heard th hear that from the Capital mm -hmm. Regional District. Uh, they have accepted, from what I understand, the discussion. Light rail is a, is a very good option. They're looking at it, but they aren't about to jump out and say, we'll do it at any cost. And I agree. That's just sound government, whether you're local government or provincial or federal. But uh, I'm looking forward to it. Again, BC Transit, I think, did a good job. I'm not sure, Vaughn, if you've seen the rollout and how they went about it and the, what the plans are. Uh, first class, I thought. Okay. Uh, well, he abandoned the independent caucus in the legislature, but there are still two independents there, and here's one of them, Bob Simpson. As a northern rural MLA and now transportation minister, doesn't it make more sense for British Columbia to have a northern gateway project where we move a lot of that east-west commercial industrial traffic out of the lower mainland into the Prince Rupert Port and Highway 16? That would make more sense from a northern development, economic development, and also stop us from spending so much money on bridges and lanes on Highway 1. As a rural MLA, I'm sure that the minister understands that, and I wonder if he thinks that's a better strategy than the one he inherited. And in Rupert, they'll tell you what, they're a day closer to China, two days closer to oh China? Oh, gosh, I think 58 ocean. hours, 58 yeah. hours. And, uh, you know, I don't think it's a better option. It is part of our option that we're working on right now. It is a mix. Uh, the Port of Prince Rupert is an incredible opportunity for us, uh, whether we're talking Ridley Terminal, where the coal and the pellets going, whether we're talking the containers that are going through the Port of Prince Rupert. I've had numerous meetings. Uh, on this in my capacity as the transportation minister, but going all the way back to my days as the mayor of Dawson Creek. It is an opportunity unlike any other on the entire west coast of North America, and we are going to capitalize on that. So great question from Bob, and uh, I know he understands it out there as well in rural BC, what we've got to do to make sure everybody uh, moves ahead. He didn't ask you about the Caribou Connector, and the only reason no. I know about that is because I looked on your website. <laughs> The Caribou Connector is upgrading the highway from Prince George all the way through the Caribou down to what, Cash Creek? Cash Creek, yeah. Uh, a couple of billion dollars? How it much is. How much is that, about 10, 15% You so know far? what, yeah, probably about 200, a little 200 plus million dollars uh, so far. Significant project each year. Projects of that magnitude, very similar to down here, you can't do them all at once. You have to piece them together. And even if you had every dollar to do them, I don't think you could get the workforce to get them all done. So we continue to do that. I've driven that highway since I was, uh, well, a young guy, 16 years old. And uh, it's getting better every year, uh, like many of our highways in this area are. There's some other priorities as well. I mean, as we see our economic activity grow, uh, there's need to increase other capacity on some of our roads as well, so we continue to really piece away at that. Nice drive. I haven't done it for about 20 years, but it my is. recollection is probably a better road now, too. <laughs> uh, okay, we got another one about transportation investment, and this one I think puts the focus back on the lower mainland and on the economic side, but here we go. One more clip on transportation. The natural resource sector in British Columbia is doing very well, especially in northern British Columbia. Is it time for British Columbia to take a look at coming to the table with some money to help construct a rail link further into northern British Columbia, especially looking at partnering with Alaska and the federal government to construct the rail link all the way through to Alaska? The Alaskans like this one. 
They do, and that uh, discussion has been around for uh, a long, long time. Yeah. Uh, right now, the railhead uh, ends in Fort Nelson, uh, up top there. You know, my view on that is if we have the ability to do it, I mean, and, uh, you know, this may or may not fit with some people's views. I know the Alaska Pipeline is another discussion uh, topic that's going on. Uh, if it was ever to work, I think they would probably want to go hand in hand. Uh, the ability, if the Alaskan Pipeline was to ever be built uh, and come down, uh, I think the route could be, uh, and this is Blair Lexner speaking, it isn't a government yeah. policy, uh, take the rail build it out as you move up, use it to move the pipe and carry it forward. Uh, I think that could be a win for everybody along the line and uh, enhance north-south movement as well as far as goods and services go. So uh, I don't think it's happening in the near future, but it is does have the potential as we look out, you know, whether it's 10, 20, 30 years, because I do believe both the Mackenzie and the Alaska Pipeline one day will be built just because of the insatious appetite we have for uh, for the natural gas. Oh, we used to sure. dream about stuff like that, didn't we? <laughs> um, I'm going to go to another clip and I can't read my handwriting, so, so I don't know what... This is going to be a mystery clip. <laughs> Let's go. I think it's Greg Davignon. The province of BC has done a great job in partnership with the federal government in building out the infrastructure and transportation corridor and gateway strategy to take advantage of growing markets around the world. Most importantly, Asia will make up 50% of the global GDP by 2020. Because of that success and that investment, however, we find the fact that we will have bottlenecks in our infrastructure and transportation corridors if we don't stay ahead of that demand curve. What will the province be doing in the next few years to ensure that that success isn't limited by a lack of investment going forward to take advantage of these huge market opportunities in Asia and around the world? All right, well, great question from Greg. What we're going to do is continue with what we have been doing, is ensuring that we ensure the capital infrastructure investment that is needed in our roads, in our ports, uh, and so on. We have the Gateway Project, and when we talk about it, is $22 billion of investment uh, between government and the private sector, uh, making sure that we don't have these bottlenecks. Our ports have significant opportunity, whether it be brake bulk, whether it be container, um, so as we move forward, uh, the work we've done to date, and I give a great deal of credit to my predecessors, both Shirley and Kevin, uh, probably, uh, hopefully the, my predecessors don't take exception, probably the most uh, thanks I want to give is to the workers in the Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure. We have a great group of people that do that, but we have to recognize our opportunity. Getting all of the resources to market is the most important thing that we have. If we have bottlenecks at any part, uh, whether it be rail, whether it be road, whether it be our ports, we have a problem. Um, one of the things that's just happened, Vaughn, we have an eight-year agreement with the longshoremen within our port. Yeah, and big, I'll tell you, big deal. people overlook that. That is a significant issue. Uh, and I want to say thank you to both sides uh, for the ability to get that, de that deal done. Um, obviously, it's good for the workers and their families, but probably most importantly, it's good for you and I because it gives some security and stability to British Columbia that our products are going to move. Um, the commitment I give to Greg is like I give to every British Columbia. I can assure you we're going to continue to invest in our infrastructure and uh, we're not going to let those bottlenecks stop our economic so growth. So the, the Portman uh, twinning is coming along and your South Fraser Perimeter Road, which is also a port access road along yes. the, the Fraser, is coming along. When those are done, do you know what the next uh, highway bottleneck project is in the Lower Mainland? Is it there's a, there's been talk of a North Fraser Road mm -hmm. along the North Fraser, or is it doing the Patello Bridge? Do you have any sense what's next? Well, you know, I wouldn't say I can point my finger and say here's where we're going next. These projects that we're doing right now are still significant projects, so we still have a time lapse. We're a couple of years from being able to complete right. that. Um, but the one thing, our planning is long range. It's not one, two years, yep. it's five, 10, 20. Um, much of the work we're doing right now is gonna open up the ability down here to get those products to where they have to go. And more importantly, when I think of the South Fraser perimeter or some of the other work we're doing, it'll get it away from the residential areas in many cases. It doesn't mean 100%, but uh, so safety, mm -hmm. environment is good. We have some challenges. The Port-au-Prince Rupert, Bob mentioned that. We're going to continue to do that. If it's uh, Highway 16, we have to look at. If it's the Northeast, to ensure that as we move oil and gas and the companies continue to drill and prosper up there. But the other side of that, and one of the most probably important facts about roads and infrastructure, we always talk about goods and services and the economy. 
you got to ensure it's about quality of life too. You and I drive these roads and you want to make sure they're safe and you want to make sure that you can enjoy your quality of life. Rural BC, um, in our area, uh, the equipment that moves on those is significant. The dust problems that come with that, it, it's a whole mix of issues that you've got to deal with. And they're not cheap. And here, I think we got time for one more question. Bill Tillman. As Minister of Infrastructure, you're responsible for some of the biggest capital projects in British Columbia and how they're financed. Under the B.C. Liberal government, debt has increased significantly. Does that concern you about the ability to pay that off? Well, it's getting up there, $60 billion, I think, according to the current financial report. It is. Our debt to GDP is a good uh, way to look at debt, what, what's affordable, what's not. And uh, I kind of sum debt up in, in two sections. There's good debt and bad debt, I guess, if I could simplify to that. Operating debt is bad debt. I mean, when you have to borrow money to run the year-to-year -year operations of the province in, in those expenditures, it's not good. As we are doing now. As we are. We are in a deficit situation. So whether it's government or you and I in our homes, we can't continue to you know, borrow money to buy the groceries. The good debt is capital debt. Whether we're investing in schools or roads or hospitals, we have an asset at the end of the day. It is all about, and I use this a lot, it's about balance, making sure your debt to G GDP does not get to a point where your bond rating agencies are saying, you know what, we're downgrading you. I mean, one downgrade could be in the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars in debt payment for us in British Columbia. It means those dollars don't go to the infrastructure projects. So um, am I concerned? I wouldn't say I'm concerned. We always keep a very close eye on it. Um, and we will spend money that we can afford to spend on behalf of the province, but no more. Uh, I want to ask about this one. It's a story that's still emerging, a concern that's still emerging in British Columbia, a relatively new thing happening here. And uh, you're hearing a lot of controversy around it. I think you'll hear more here with a question on fracking. Sean Holman. Blair, before you left Cabinet over the HST, you were the minister responsible for energy mines and petroleum resources. And in that capacity, you essentially had oversight over the fracking situation in northeastern BC. Now, we've seen that activity tightly controlled or even prohibited in other jurisdictions, but we haven't taken similar measures in this province. Do you think that from your time as the minister responsible for that activity, you made the right decision and not bringing forward tighter restrictions. You force water under pressure into shale rock, it fractures and releases natural gas. Mm -hmm. and that's uh, how you get the gas out of the rock. In a nutshell, that's it. Now, I think we do, do have some pretty good oversight in our oil and gas industry right now. The Oil and Gas Commission uh, is our regulatory body that looks after that. Uh, the one thing, when it comes to fracking, I know Quebec obviously raised some issues where they put a moratorium, no more. Uh, I've just started to read their findings there, their depths, the depth of where you go to. I mean, we are two, two and a half kilometers down. There's, uh, I don't believe that there is an issue when it comes to water aquifers. They just are not that deep for our freshwater aquifers. So uh, the fracking, uh, do I want to make sure we do the best we can? Yeah. Do I share the concern that some think we should just stop it altogether? No, I don't. Uh, I think industry, uh, to be honest with you, has beat government to the punch right across this country. I think they did a lot of good things on their own. They didn't have to be told you have to do it this way or do it that. The men and women that work in this industry are our friends, they're our neighbors, many times they're our family. So they're not out there trying to hurt the environment. and. Uh, we always try and improve on what we do, but as long as we need that resource, uh, we're going to have to find a way to do it. And that's going to be the end of the show tonight. Thank you to Blair Lexstrom for being on the show. Thanks, Appreciate Bob. you doing it. Next week on Voice of BC, Adrian Dix, our new leader of the opposition. Thank you for watching Voice of BC, bringing the legislature and BC politics into your living room. Good night.